preaching on this morning is basically the state of your heart. And the title of my sermon this morning is, Is Your Heart Right With God? Now, at this church, we do a lot of preaching on, on different things. And one of the things we focus on sometimes is, is preaching on sin and trying to get sin out of our lives. And, and we'll go back to the Old Testament, New Testament. We'll preach the whole counsel of God. We preach all of it. And the reason why we preach these sermons and we do hard preaching and, and I might get up here and scream and yell about sin and things like that is so that we can get right with God. Because the goal is that we want to do what's right by God. We don't want to be in error. We don't want to be, you know, on God's bad side, if you will. Now, we know that if we're saved, we're saved by grace. We know that salvation's a free gift. We know we don't earn salvation in, in any way, shape, or form. But because we're born again, because we're believers, I'm going to assume everyone here is a believer. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. We want to be good children. So this is why I spend a lot of time preaching things that, that you might, might make you feel uncomfortable, that, that might try to you know, work at you a little bit, because I want everyone here to grow. And, and I want to do what's right in God's eyes. I, it's, you know, I could spend week after week just telling everybody how good everything is and how great the world is and how great God is and how great everything is. And we can walk out of here just feeling great every, every week. But if we have errors, if we have sins in our life, if we have other things that's, that's keeping us with, from having like full fellowship with God or, or, or putting us as being, you know, disobedient or bad children, you know, I'd rather know about those things. I don't want to just send people away without, without having that type of knowledge. But no matter how much preaching you hear, no matter what church you go to, no matter what message you hear, no matter how many times you read your Bible, if your heart's not right, it's not going to do you any good. It has to start with your heart. You have to have the desire to even want to hear the word of the Lord. Amen. Now, before you got saved, and we're, I'm going to start with this, you're in Colossians 3. Keep your finger there. If you just go backwards a few pages to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look really briefly at a couple of verses here about where our heart was before salvation. Before you get saved, you know, when you're just basically off like the rest of the world. And everyone's got a different story, different testimony, things, you know, different past and it, it doesn't really matter on the individual level because everybody was in the world prior to salvation. Look at verse number one of Ephesians chapter two. The Bible says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. This is talking about Satan. We, we, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. Now, Go back, if you would, to Colossians chapter 3. We're going to see something similar there. Prior to salvation, you don't have the Spirit of God residing inside of you. Don't, you weren't, you're not born again. You don't have that regenerated spirit. So what does your life consist of? I mean, ultimately, it's going to consist of fulfilling the lusts or desires of your flesh and of your mind. And that's what people do. I mean, you, you know, a lot of people spend their time, you know, just trying to make a lot of money, get conveniences, live comfortably. And, you know, when you're comfortable, you're appealing to your, to your flesh, to just being in that, you know, fleshly, physical comfort zone. Some people go off and they get into drugs and, and alcohol and just other things, hedonistic lifestyles, fornication, you know, whatever just feels good. That might be the path that people take. Now, look, I'm not saying that when you get saved that none of that stuff ever happens again, that it all goes away. Because we still have this wicked, sinful flesh that we live in. But when you get saved, what happens is, is you have a dichotomy now. You have a new spirit, but you still have the old flesh. So now there's a war going on. Now there's a battle going on within you where your flesh still wants to take you into sin. Your flesh still wants to do those things that feel good and fulfill the lusts of your flesh while your spirit wants to do what's right and wants to please God and do the things that God has for you to do. 
And that's the struggle that we have. Look at Colossians 3, verse number 1. The Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, and we are if our faith is in Christ. The resurrection of Jesus Christ saved our souls. If we're risen with him, he says, Seek those things which are above. And the reason why he says to seek those things which are above because it's not just automatic. It doesn't just happen all on its own. Just because you're saved doesn't mean you're always just going to do good all the time. We need to put effort in. We need to seek those things. We need to try to do what's right and seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Verse number two, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We need to be having our affection. What is our desire? What is it that we care about the most on things that are heavenly things, not things on this earth, not just physical, carnal pleasures that we might get from this earth. Verse number um, three, for ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. And then he lists them off. This, this is our flesh, our fleshly desires. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Same phrase that we saw in Ephesians chapter 2, on the children of disobedience. In the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. But now, so you're saying, look, you lived this way. You were in this stuff. You were just like everybody else. But now... Ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. We need, we need to be getting our heart to the place where we want to put off the old man. We don't want to go back and have these revelings and think about all the sin we got into and oh, how much fun that was. Oh, back when I was a kid, I used to do this and do that and brag and boast about all the trouble you got into and all the, the parties and the, you know, whatever, whatever it is. That ought not to be where your heart is at. If you're born again, if you're a child of God, you ought to have put away and mortified those things. Just as when Christ died on the cross and, and put away our sin, we ought to leave that sin down there and think of heavenly things and have our affections on things of God and not on things on this earth. The Bible says, in, you don't have to turn there, but um, in Hebrews eleven six, 6, the Bible says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. After you have salvation, you have a new spirit, and you're actually able to please God. Prior to being saved, you cannot please God. It's impossible because you don't even know how. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please him because if you're even going to come to God at all, you have to believe that he is. You have to have faith in him. And in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the Bible says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We, we, we need to strive to walk in that newness of life. So where does God, that, that's where our hearts, we had, we had some descriptions of where our hearts might have been before we got saved, right? In the fornication and, other, and just other things, the, the, the fleshly desires of this earth, where God wants our heart to be. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read for you from 1 Chronicles 28, verse number 9. 1 Chronicles 28, 9 reads, And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searcheth all hearts. God searches our hearts. He looks, you know, I don't know what's in your heart today. Your actions can show a little bit about what's inside of your heart, but you know who knows your heart is God. You know, there's a lot of people out there that put up a front and will want other people just to think that they're real spiritual and they're real holy and things like that. 
And you know what? You might trick a lot of people, but so what? Because all you care about, you know, all those people typically care about is just looking good in other people's eyes. But you know, you can't fool God. God does search the heart. And you know, if you come in week after week and you put on a big show, you might fool me. You might fool other people. Good for you. Okay? But what good is that going to do when you can't fool God? See, the reason why, we don't, we don't come to church and try to show off how spiritual we are and use all the spiritual language just so that we could try to make ourselves look better among other people. That's not the point at all. If that's a, you, you're completely missing it if that's what you think this is all about. The point of, try, you know, of preaching on sin and trying to get our lives cleaned up is so that we can be right with God. It has nothing to do with impressing anybody else. And God does see our hearts. God knows our hearts. And we ought to be happy and desirous to do the things that God has for us to do. And God knows our hearts. See, God's looking for someone. And so he's telling Solomon in 1 Chronicles 28, he's, he's looking for someone to serve him with a perfect heart. Someone who's, who's willing and, and says with a willing mind. He wants to do it. I want to serve the Lord. I'm going to serve God with a perfect heart. It says, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And those are some strong words. That was, that was to, uh, to Solomon. Telling him that, look, if you seek God, he'll find, you'll be found. He'll be found. God, God is not trying to hide himself from people that are actively seeking him. Anyone who wants to know God, hey, God will be found. But if you forsake him, you have nothing to do with him, he says, you know what, he'll forsake you too. That's where God wants you. He wants you to have a perfect heart. He wants you to have a willing mind. He wants you to serve him. But where do you want your heart to be? And that's the big question this morning. The important question for you. You're in Romans chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse number 1. Because it, it, it has to be willing. You can go through all the motions. And I believe that you should for, for many of the things that God tells us to do. Whether, whether we want to or not, we ought to just do them. Right? I mean, when I tell my children to do something, I would much prefer that they'd be happy to do the things that I tell them to do. But it's better for them just to do it even if they're not happy about it and their heart might not be in it, then to just not do it at all, right? So understand what I'm saying here. We, we, we ought to do what God tells us to do just because God said. But what's even better and what God really wants is for our hearts to be in it and, and to just full-heartedly accept what God has for us and to do the things he has for us to do. Look at Romans 8, verse number 1. We'll start reading there. The Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit look at verse number five for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace so many people don't want to be, you know, held back by God's laws. Why do I got to obey God's law? Oh, man, you just don't want me to have any fun, do you? God's got all these rules on me. Well, to be, to be carnally minded is death. It's not good. See, God doesn't make up rules just so that you can have a miserable life. And kids, your parents don't make up rules for you so you can have a miserable life. They actually love you and care about you. And whether you believe it or not, they have more knowledge and wisdom than you do. I know it's a hard thing for kids to grasp. They think they're so smart and they know more than their parents and everything else. But mom and dad love you. And the rules that they impose on you is supposed to be for your own benefit. 
It's because they've already lived many years and they've already gained wisdom and, so, and many times the hard way. And they don't want to see you going through the same thing. And you know what? God's the same way. He knows the end result of the things that we might want to get into now because it feels good for a moment. It feels good for a moment to go get drunk or go get high. But you know what? The end of that is going to ruin your life. You make all kinds of bad decisions. People get hurt. People get killed. Lives get destroyed. So God just says, don't do it. Amen. Sleeping around, committing fornication. Oh, yeah, it feels real good for the moment. But you miss out on so many other things. You get diseases. You get, you know, there, there's so many ways that it's going to cause problems in your life. That's why the Bible says to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Boy, doesn't that sound good to live a life where you're at peace just internally? Where you can go through day by day and not be troubled in your spirit? Well, for walking in the spirit, we can have that peace. Even if bad things may be going on around us, you can know that peace. And it's a great feeling to have when you know you're doing right by God. Everything could be crumbling around you and you could still have peace. It doesn't mean you're not concerned about the things going on. It doesn't mean anything else, but you can, you can have a level of peace about you because being spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse number seven, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. If you are in here today and your mind is, all you think about is things of this world and things that are, that are just physically appealing to you, the Bible says you're at enmity with God. That's the exact opposite of what God wants you to be. He wants you to be spiritually minded, not carnally minded, not thinking just about, hey, this feels good, so I'm going to do it, regardless of what God's word says. Verse number eight, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. God is not happy with you if you are in the flesh. Verse number nine, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Verse number 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And that's a pretty stern warning there. He's saying, look, if you live after the flesh, you're going to die. Bottom line. Because the, the, you know, the wages of sin is death and the end result of our sin, you know, um, and sin when it is finished bringeth forth death. It, it's not going to end well. We need to make sure that we are doing our best to walk in the Spirit, and that our heart is set right to walk in the Spirit. But ultimately, you have to decide for yourself, what do you want? I mean, the Bible gives you wisdom. It gives you knowledge. It gives you the instructions. It tells you right from wrong. It tells you what's going to happen. It's a very prophetic book. If you choose to walk down the path of just living a real carnal life, it's not going to go well for you. you. You can't cheat God's system. You might feel like you get away with things here and there, but in the end, the Bible says, whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You need to have, again, it boils down to faith and having faith in God's word. People get too short-sighted and they think, oh, I'm doing this and this and everything's going just fine because you're looking at a very, very short segment, a very, very short distance between what you think you're getting away with and what's actually going to happen further down the road. The consequences come back to you. And again, children, this is another reason why your parents have a lot more wisdom than you do because they've been through this. They've seen the reaping of things that could have happened years earlier in their lives. Things that they knew they were doing were wrong. Things I knew, I, this has happened to me. I know personally from experience, I've had plenty of these events happen where everything's going great, I'm living in sin, I'm doing what I want to do, and everything seems to be going really well, which in the midst of it all is miserable anyways. But you try to trick yourself and think, oh no, this is actually real fun. And then later on, 
things really get bad. And it's a direct result of living that carnal, sinful lifestyle. We need to just trust God, trust him at his word, trust him that he knows what's best for us, and then take action to do what's right. Now, if you spend your days looking, just, just, just day after day, I mean, think about your life, because this is going to determine where your heart is. When you think about your daily activities, if you spend your days just looking for entertainment or other ways to just simply find pleasure, right? Just if that's what you're focused on day after day, then you're carnally minded and worldly. Because that's what, I mean, that's by definition, you're all you're thinking about is just satisfying or gratifying your flesh. Now, it may not be in an extremely sinful way, but if that's just all you care about and all you're focused on, you're carnally minded and that's at enmity with God. The Bible, you know, there's, there's many things that are not inherently sinful, okay, that can become sinful when that is what your life is all about. I'll give you some examples of this. You know, things that might consume your thoughts and most of your time. Things that are not inherently sinful, how about just going to work? Working. There's nothing sinful about it. Actually, the Bible says that we ought to, especially if you're a man, you ought to provide for your own household. You ought to work hard. These are things that are good qualities, but you know what? It can become sinful if you just only work all the time and all you're interested in is making that money and just making more and more and more and more money. You could be working real hard and working hard is a good, is a good attribute to have but you have to know when to switch and transition from, hey, I'm working for the things that I need versus just working to get an abundance and accumulation of wealth on this earth and not being minded of the things that are in heaven and not living a life that you're, you're trying to lay up treasures in heaven. Instead, you're just laying up treasures in earth. That can become sinful. How about just eating food? There's another thing. It's not inherently sinful at all. We need to eat to live, right? It's, it's a good thing. And God has blessed us with so much variety and different types of food, and they taste good. And it's a joyful thing. And it's a nice thing. But you know what? Eating can become sinful too when you just, that's all you think about. You just consume too much, and you overeat, and, and you become indulgent in all these various types of food. That can become a sinful thing. Playing games, just, just spend a little bit of time with your family or whatever. Hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not inherently sinful. But when that's all you think about and that's all you do and you're not spending your time doing anything else, that becomes sinful. Taking vacations, going on trips. Again, same thing. Even, I mean, here's one for me, even going hunting. I love going hunting. But if I just focus on doing that all the time and I'm not looking to serve God, I'm not concerned with the things of the Spirit then I'm at enmity with God because all I'm focused on is doing the things that I like. Hey, I like hunting. I like going on vacation. I like doing that. And if you just think about that all the time and that consumes your life, you're not right with God. We need to get the things that ought to be most important first in our life. And we need to put those to the forefront of our mind. And you know what? Our flesh, it's hard to overcome that sometimes because those things are so much fun and it's easy to get distracted with everything else but see, Satan wants nothing more than you to be distracted with all the cares of this world and not doing any of the work for the Lord. And the work for the Lord is incumbent on every believer. It's every believer's job to, to, to serve God. And he has a plan for you individually. And everybody, you know, the Bible says, I, I preached on this last week, but the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to Christ by giving them the gospel, that's everybody's job. We all have that job. So those are some things that are, that are not inherently sinful, but they can become sinful if that's all you think about. And then, of course, there's other things that, that are already inherently sinful that people get uh, hooked up in and, and just consumed with. Uh, I mentioned already fornication, adultery, pornography, right? Uh, drunkenness, drugs, these types of things. Turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. You're in, if you're still in Colossians, you turn backwards to Galatians, or you're in Romans, weren't you? Go forward to Galatians. Galatians chapter 5. For a long stretch 
of my life, after I was saved, mind you, I got saved when I was 20 years old, for a long stretch of my life, what I was concerned about and what I cared about was I went to work because I had to go to work because I always, you know, I was brought up with, with a good character of just going to work and, you know, providing for yourself. But you know what I was consumed with? Every day, going out to a bar. Just going out and having fun with my friends. Going out and getting drunk. Go, I mean, that, that's what I thought about. That's what my life was about. That's what I cared about. And as that enmity with God. Now, was I saved? Yeah, I was saved. I was a child of God. Why? Because salvation is a free gift. Because I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and he gave me eternal life. That transaction was settled. But you know what? I was a bad child. I didn't listen. I wasn't listening to my heavenly father. I didn't care about things in heaven. I cared about things on this earth. I cared about gratifying my flesh. And what a waste. What a waste. I wasted years of my life and dealt with all kinds of things that I... I I regret to this day that I never should have had to deal with if I would have just listened to God's word. Just listen. Listen to the instructions. God's already warned us about these things. And that's just one example. And that's why I'm bringing this up because I don't want you to think that I got this holier than thou attitude of thinking I'm so righteous and you're not and you all need to get right. No, look, we all need to get right and we all need to, to regularly focus on these things and, and hey, if serving God ought to be important to you, where is your heart? If your heart is just on the things of this world, you need to change that. You ought to change that. Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number 16. The Bible says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. And this is what I was talking about near the beginning of the sermon. When you're born again, you're saved. You've got the spirit, you've got the flesh. These two are contrary to each other. The flesh wants you to sin, but the spirit wants you to do what's right. Verse 18, but if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So it's going to list off the things that the flesh wants you to do. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. All of these wicked sins, these are works of the flesh. And this is what your flesh is going to try to get you to do, to get you to, to stay off of doing what's right and walking in the spirit. And see, walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh are two different things. You can't mix the two. You can't be like, well, I'm going to walk in the spirit and in the flesh. It doesn't work that way. You're either in one or the other. You can't say, well, I want to have, I want to have Jesus in my beer too and just have it all mixed together in a bundle package. You don't get it that way. It doesn't work that way. You get, you get one or the other. But what's in your heart? Do you crave all of the worldly things and despise the things of God? This is where you don't want to let your heart get to, where you're going, oh, it's Sunday again. Oh, I got to go to church. That's a dangerous place for your heart to be in. Because if, if you're that despite, despiteful against even just attending a church service, how much are your affections set on the things of this world when even showing up to a church service is something that, that you don't want to do. You ought to like coming to church. You ought, you ought to want to hear from God's word. You ought to want to sing praise. You ought to want a fellowship with other believers. You ought to want these things. And if, if you don't have that desire, you need to do something different. You need to change to, to try to get that desire. You need to reanalyze and focus what is important in your life. What really is important? Is it really that important to, to just go out to the movies and play games and play, you know, what, whatever it is. I don't know. I mean, whatever it is in your life, is that really that important? When you look back on your life, here's a good way to think about things. When you look back on your life, what's really going to matter? You know what's going to matter most is the way that you interact with other people and how many people you lead to Christ and the example that you can lead to help other people out in things that matter eternally because 
all of the physical things, all of the booze in the world, all of the, the money in the world is all going to be burned up and going to be gone in a very short amount of time. It's going to be gone. It's not going to exist anymore. It won't even be there. It has no eternal value whatsoever. But you know, who, you know what sticks around for a long time is people. People's souls don't, don't uh, disintegrate. They don't just come into nothing as the money and everything else will. People's souls either end up in heaven or hell. And that's what really matters. At the end of the day, that's really what matters. And you know, the Bible tells us that we have an, an inheritance in heaven that, that, that God has, has laid up treasures for us, especially for those, those who want to do the work or the judgment seat of Christ. Hey, whatever things that you do that has eternal value, that abides the fire, you'll get rewarded for that. Those things last forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. It would make sense. See, it makes sense in the short term. Right? People are always talking about, we talk about finances, right? If we're just talking about money, it makes sense to put some money away for when you get older, for when you have a time of need, right? To be able to uh, get through rough times. It makes sense, right? Just, just worldly speaking here. It makes a lot of sense. People put money away in a 401k or whatever to just have something for when you're not as capable of working. When it's a lot harder to work, you've got some money put in. That, that makes sense. That's a good, that's, that's wise. It's a good thing to do. But you know what's even wiser than that is putting things away for eternity. Because your, your little nest egg, your 401k, you might die before then. And it's all going to be burned up anyways. But you know what never goes away is the rewards that, that Jesus has for you. That never goes away. If you spent your entire life just seeking those things, you'd do very well. You say, but I'm not a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor. You can seek the Lord's will and do the Lord's will in your life every day of your life and never be a pastor. God doesn't call everybody to pastor a church, but he does call us all to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That is something that is incumbent on all of us, and that's something that guaranteed you will receive rewards for. And not just rewards, but, I mean, how great would that be at the end of your life, you breathe your last breath, to then to be able to meet all the people whose lives you've influenced. People who decided to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because you decided, you know what? I'm not going to just live for this world and live for these pleasures. I'm going to do what he has for me to do. And as a result, reach other people, other strangers, people I've never even met before. Now all of a sudden, whereas they may have gone to hell because I've opened up my mouth in speaking boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ, now they're going to be in heaven with me. What a great reward that is in and of itself. What a difference that makes. Having a difference in other people's lives that's going to last forever. As opposed to just closing your eyes, shutting your ears, and I just want to feel good temporarily. And then be left with no rewards, you know, when uh, at the judgment seat of Christ. Do you have to force yourself to come to church and read your Bible? and to try to live a relatively righteous life? If so, you've got a serious heart problem. If that's such a burden, if it's such a burden to just do some of the things that God... Now look, we all struggle with various sins. I get it. But even that, that's not a good thing. That's a problem, right? Hope, would to God we could just not have problems and we could live perfect lives. That would be great. We, we have to recognize we have the flesh. We understand that, but... You can still struggle with sins, but have your heart right. King David is a perfect example of this. King David had plenty of sins in his life, did he not? Especially when it got to the point to where he committed adultery and murder. But you know what David had? The Bible says that David was a, was a man after God's own heart. He had a heart where when he did wrong, it grieved him and he repented and he wanted to get right with God. And he had a heart where he cared about other people. And when God was going to bring judgment on people, he said, God, you know, let your judgment rest on me, not on these people. You're these sheep. They haven't done anything. Put it on me. And owning up and taking responsibility for the things that he did. He had a good heart and he had that heart all the way to the end. He made mistakes along the way. Look, we all do. But if your heart is in the right place, you could keep coming back to God, keep humbling yourself, and ultimately have a life of inner peace. 
and a life that actually means something. How about when other church members are in need or other people that you know are in need? Is it just some big burden for you and you just get annoyed? And, oh, I can't believe they need something from me. Or do you actually have a desire to help people? Is that something you actually want to do? These are areas that are heart problems that we need to work on. If this, if this becomes some big you know, deal for us and, and it's, a, it's a selfish mindset where we don't think about what other people are going through because it's easy to not think about it in their shoes until you're in their shoes. And when you're not willing to help other people out, just think about how it would feel when you have a time of need and nobody's there for you. We need to check our hearts today. And I don't expect perfection, but we need to, if, if our heart's in the right place, we're going to be a lot more likely to do what's right and to enjoy it. I mean, I enjoy coming to church. It's not a drudgery. I enjoy doing these things. And I, I honestly could say that. I, I'm, not, I'm not just lying to you. I, I love coming to church. I love seeing all you. I love doing it. Now, there are times where I feel like I just have to do certain things. I just have to read my Bible. Or I just have to, you know. And that's not right. I shouldn't feel that way, but I, you still ought to do them. Right? And the goal is then to just check yourself and be like, you know what? I, I don't know what I'm thinking. You know, I'm putting other things as being more important in my life and thinking that this is such a burden. You know what? Jesus did so much for me by paying for every single one of my sins and giving me a free gift of salvation that what is too much? Literally, what is too much for, for, for God to ask of me at all? Is it too much to, to just listen to what he tells me to do and not to do? Is that, is that really such a big deal after he's already given me a gift of eternal life? Is it really so much? Oh, man, I can't believe he wants me to listen to him again. I have to read my Bible again? Come on, I've already read that thing. No, we need to keep hearing from God. Let's listen to him. Oh, he wants me to go to church now? Yeah, and, and, and spend time with other people and edify other people. You know, it's not just about yourself when you come to church. It's about other people. A church is a congregation. We're a group of people. We're a family here, brothers and sisters in Christ. And you coming to church isn't just about you. It's about other people. You know, other people get encouraged or discouraged based on whether or not you're even here. You know what encourages me? Every, I, I get encouraged. I mean, if no one else does, I get encouraged when I see the same faces every week. I do. I, I love seeing everybody that shows up to church. It, it encourages me to no end. You'll never understand, especially in such a small church. It's an encouragement. And it's not just me. There's other people too. And we need to be focused on others and not just consider it such a drudgery. We need our hearts to be right and focused on other people. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. Because everything I'm trying to explain here is said much better in Philippians chapter 2. If you're in Galatians, just go forward a couple pages, Philippians chapter 2. Because this is, this is one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. This is the heart that God wants us to have. Let's check our hearts today versus what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2. And, and you check for yourself how well you match up. And, I, and none of us is going to be perfect, but but identify the problem areas that you might have in your own heart so that you can fix that, so you can change that, so you can try to, to get right and, and to soften up your heart a little bit. Philippians chapter number 2, we're going to start reading in verse number 1. The Bible reads, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Fulfill ye my joy that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. That's looking at other people and saying, you know what? You're better than me. That's how he's saying to look at other people of saying, you know what? I'm not more important than you. You're more important than me. 
Verse number four, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Again, having a mindset of caring about other people. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. This is important to keep in mind. If Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, is able to humble himself. I mean, you talk about anyone having humility, God becoming a servant to his own creation. That is humbling. And the next time you think you're too good for anybody else, you remember what Jesus did. If anyone truly was too good for this whole world, it's Jesus Christ. Yet he humbled himself. He allowed the shame and the ridicule and the mock and the false accusations and the beatings and the spittings and the nailing to the cross and the bearing of our sins in his own body on the tree. And he is our example. And why did he, did he do it for himself? No, he did nothing in his earthly ministry for himself. It was all for others. It was all for you. Where is your heart? Look at Christ's heart. That's where our heart needs to be. Let's keep reading here. Let's jump down to verse number 12. The Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. And look at what it says there, both to will, to want to, and to do it. He says, God works in you through that spirit that we have to want to do it and to do it. God wants both. He doesn't just want you to do the things. He doesn't just want you to show up to church. He doesn't just want you to read your Bible. He wants you to want to do it. God gave us this amazing gift of free will. We, I mean, we get to choose. We get to choose. He doesn't force any of that on us. He tells us and commands us what he wants us to do, but it's our choice. I tell my kids, again, same example. I tell my kids and command them to do things. It's still their choice. I mean, they, they have a will or a mind of their own, and they can choose to do what they want to do. And just as with God, you know, there's ramifications for the things that we choose to do, if we choose not to do things or we choose to do things. But I would like for nothing else than for my kids to not only obey, but to want to, but, but to understand at least enough to say, Dad, I know you love me. You've already demonstrated that you love me. And not only am I going to do what you say, I'll gladly do what you say. And that's the attitude we ought to have for God. God, we know God loves us. He sacrificed his only begotten son for us. Let's do what he wants and want to do what he wants. Look at verse number 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Murmuring is complaining. You know, when we serve God, we ought not be complaining about it. I don't know about you, but it drives me nuts to hear people complain. I, I mean, it really... It's such a self, again, it's a self-centered, selfish attitude when we just start complaining about whatever. And you're like, look, God has given us so many good things. And when you just focus on the negative things, that's when you start complaining. Take in everything. You know, it's amazing to me when you see people, there's people out there that have nothing in their favor, have not any opportunities, have grown up in, 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 in just you know, the poorest surroundings, abusive surroundings, and yet they can have a good attitude about things. And then you have people that have grown up with practically a silver spoon in their mouth complaining about everything. And nothing's ever right. Nothing's ever good enough. Because the one is just thinking about them. 
and wanting everything to be done for them. And me, 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 me. Whereas the other person is easier to think about, hey, I want to help other people out. And you know what? The person who's thinking about others has way more peace than the person who's always just thinking about themselves. Because you're never satisfied. You can be complaining and murmuring to the day that you die if all you think about is yourself. It's a miserable life. So last place I'll uh, turn to, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's the last place and we're done. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2. Again, just a, just a few pages forward from Philippians. We're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Christian life and the life that God wants us to leave, it may not be easy. You're going to have difficult times, but it's, it shouldn't be a drudgery. You shouldn't have to drag your feet and, and just almost unwillingly go through and, 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 and go through the motions. Your heart needs to be in it. We're going to look at verse number one of second, of, uh, excuse me, first Thessalonians chapter number two. The Bible reads, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. The disciples suffered a lot of persecution. They were shamefully entreated. He said, even though we went through these things and had these difficult times, so we're still bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God. With much contention, people fighting about it, people trying to stop them and arrest them and beat them up and everything else. That still didn't prevent them from doing what God told them to do and from doing what was right. Why? Because their heart was in it. If their heart wasn't in it and you face that type of persecution, you're out. I don't care who you are. If you don't really want to do it to begin with, at the little bit of resistance, at the, the smallest amount of persecution, you're going to be out. Your heart has to be in it. Because with your heart not being in it, you're not going to last long at all. Verse number three, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God. And look at this, this attitude, it's this mindset, as we were allowed of God to be put in trust, with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. God tries the hearts. God knows the hearts. And they're treating, look, it's not a burden to them. They're looking at this as what an honor. I can't believe God has entrusted the glorious gospel and, and, the, and the, uh, delivering the gospel to people unto us. God has honored us with us. I can't believe he's done that for us. But wow, what a great task. Let's take this task serious and not just blow it off and say, well, if I got enough time for it, God, you know, I'm busy. I've got a lot of other things to do. Say, no, God, God gave us this and entrusted us with this. We're going to do our best for this. We're going to put our heart into it. And I don't care if people are, are persecuting us or, or doing anything against us. We're going to go and make sure this gets done because God has trusted us to preach the gospel. That's the heart. That's what we need to strive to be at. Verse number five, for neither at any time used we flattering words as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness, nor of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others, that we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. See, we're not doing it for us. We're not trying to, to trick you. We're not using flattering words. We're just telling you the truth. Verse number seven, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing. Again, there's that word willing. It's what you want. It's the desire of their heart. We were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. These are people in Thessalonica, people that they never knew before. The Apostle Paul was going out and Timothy and they were, they were preaching the gospel to complete strangers and foreigners. They weren't children of Israel. They weren't Jews. They were Gentiles. They go out to, to these other places and they're just preaching the gospel of God. He says, we were willing not only to have imparted the gospel unto you 
and to give you that great gift and to show you that great truth, he says, we're willing to give our own souls. We were willing to give everything for you. Complete strangers. Because you were dear unto us. Verse number nine, for you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of work. That's why you need to have your heart into it. If you're going to do the work that God has for you to do, your heart needs to be in it. God tries the heart. God sees the heart. Where is your heart today? You decide for yourself, where was your heart? Look at, look at your life. Where was your heart? Just try to think back, whatever, however long ago it's been since you got saved. Where was your heart? Where do you think your heart should be? And where is your heart right now? Is your heart right now closer to where it was before you got saved? Or is it closer to where you want it to be? Think about that. And wherever you are, let's today focus on getting our heart right to where we want it to be, to where we see all this great scripture and we see the examples that were laid out before us. And we see, oh, you can see the example of Christ and say, yeah, but that was Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. He was perfect. I can't be perfect. Okay, well, what about the apostles? They were men. They were not perfect. Yet they demonstrated their heart. And God knew their heart. And their heart is true. And we can, we can see that here. We can see the heart that they had. So this isn't too much for you. This isn't something that's impossible. We can all have a heart like that. But it's up to you to decide, is that really what you want? I believe that we're, we're in the last days. That we're, the times are running out. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 12, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And we see the love of many waxing colder and colder. The more that iniquity abounds, the more that sin is just running rampant, the more people's hearts get cold. Don't let that coldness influence you. Because the more you're out in the world, the more, the more you're around this stuff, the more you're around wickedness and sin, you know what? It's going to impact you. That's why church is that much more, that, so much more as you see the day approaching, as it says in Hebrews chapter 10. That we forsake not the assembling of ourselves together and so much the more as you see the day approaching. It's so much more important. Why? Because the love of many is waxing cold and we need to make sure our heart doesn't wax cold. That our heart is on fire and fervent and, and active to serve God. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for, um, for the great examples that we have in your words. Lord, I pray that you will please just stir up our souls. Stir up our hearts, dear Lord, and our minds. Help us to to get on track with the way where you would want us to be. I pray that you would please um, just help us to, to not be so focused on ourselves and on the, the things of this world and all the distractions that this life can bring forth. God, it's so easy to just get caught up in everything else and just to, to put you and, and your commands by the wayside. Lord, uh, I can't speak for everybody here, but I know I, I, um, I've been guilty of that and I pray that you would please just help us to keep in memory and to, to stir us up, to, to put the, the first things first and, and that you ought to be the, the primary thing in our life and we ought to be focused about serving you every day. Dear Lord, help us to be in our Bibles every day and to hear from you every day and that we'd open up our ears and our hearts to the things that you'd have us to learn. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.